What if I told you that in just seven minutes, you could reduce your risk of burnout for at least a week? Well, in today's episode, I'm going to be reviewing a research article about a well-being intervention that set out to do just that. This article was written out of Duke University, and it's titled Gratitude at Work, a Prospective Cohort Study of a Web-Based Single Exposure Well-Being Intervention for Healthcare Workers. This study looked at how writing a gratitude letter to someone in the healthcare worker's life that had made an impact on their well-being could change their subjective happiness, work-life balance, and emotional exhaustion scores. If you're not familiar, emotional exhaustion is one of the three key indicators for burnout, which is how it could actually impact your burnout scores over time. If you're interested in reading the article, I have that available on my show notes on my website. You can find it at happyfarmlife.com forward slash resources forward slash HPL 108. So let's dive into a little bit about this study. There were 1,575 healthcare workers that were assigned to complete one of two gratitude letter writing prompts. One of them was more focused on others, and the other one was more focused on other people. I'll explain that later. Before completing the prompt, the healthcare workers took an initial assessment or a baseline assessment that looked at three different key areas, which I mentioned earlier, that subjective happiness, work-life balance, and emotional exhaustion. Before doing the writing exercise, healthcare workers were asked to do a initial baseline line assessment in three different categories, the subjective happiness category, work-life balance category, and emotional exhaustion. The workers were then asked to complete their letter based on the prompts assigned, and then there was an email with a follow-up assessment that they could do one week later. It's also important to mention for reasons you'll understand later that the respondents were given their response scores to the emotional exhaustion category, so they were able to see what their relative rate of emotional exhaustion was before completing the letter. Before diving into the three main aims of this study, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on those who participated in this study. First to note is the majority of those who responded were white females, with nearly 74% of the respondents being white and nearly 70 being female. Now, given the fact that 74-ish percent of healthcare workers in the United States are female, that isn't too shocking there. Most of the respondents in this particular study were either physicians, some type of non-nursing manager, or were classified as other. They gave several categories of healthcare workers, and other was just ones that were not listed on the survey. For my pharmacist out there, they made up 8.76% of respondents with 138 completing the intervention. Now, one major limitation of the study that I have to point out before we talk about the data was that only 227 of that 1,575 respondents actually completed the follow-up assessment, which means there wasn't a lot of data to go off of as far as the longer-term benefit, so that one-week benefit of writing this letter. Because that ends up being around 17% of people who started the intervention and wrote the letter that actually completed the full study. There are a few reasons the authors think this happened. So first is web-based interventions typically have a very high dropout rate. They also said that they don't think their expectations were set very well as far as making sure respondents knew that they were supposed to fill out this one-week survey. And then they also admitted that they lacked the ability to confirm the data or didn't put a way in place to confirm the contact information for the respondents at the time that they were registering that information. I also wanted to point out here, aside from that small group limitation, there's also the limitation of we do not know whether or not the people who responded to the survey were more likely to see benefit because oftentimes people who do see benefit are more likely to respond to these surveys because they want to share that they had positive results. So you may see a higher percentage of the people who responded to this seeing benefit than you would if we actually got responses from all 1,575 of them. However, I think the results are still interesting and worth looking at. So what did this seven-minute gratitude practice look like? Each participant was given this prompt. Think of someone who has done something amazing for you. This person could be alive or no longer with us. This person contributed to your well-being in a big way. Spend the next seven minutes writing a genuine, kind, and appreciative two-part note. So at this point, participants were randomized into one of two conditioned groups. The prompt was either self-focused or other focused, because in past studies and other settings where they looked at doing these types of writing practices, they found that self-focused prompts showed a greater change from baseline. So the authors wanted to see if that was true in people who are experiencing emotional exhaustion as well. 
The first prompt was the self-focus prompt, which requested writers to talk about how the other person impacted them and why they thought that they were important to them. So it read part one, tell this person what they did, how it impacted you and the benefits you received. And part two of the letter was to tell this person why it was important to you. The second letter option was the other focused prompt. And that requested the writer to talk about how the other person made them feel and what the actions that they did said about them as a person. And it read part one, tell this person what they did, how it impacted you and how it made you feel and why it was important to you. Part two was to tell this person what it says about them, that they did this amazing thing for you. You may include what it says about your relationship to this person. So as you could tell, the second prompt really focused on the other person, the person you're writing the letter about. And the first letter was more focused on what it meant to you and you as a person that this person helped you. Now that we have that background information out of the way, let's dive into the three aims of this study. Aim one was assessing the change in well-being metrics between baseline and one week of the follow-up and a differential efficacy by instruction condition, so either that self-focused or other focused prompt. So both conditions showed improvement in emotional exhaustion, that subjective happiness, and work-life balance. However, what was shocking to the authors was the fact that there was not a statistical significant difference in the change for baseline for the person who was doing the self-focused letter and the person who was doing the other focus letter. You may also be wondering, because I talked about how many people did not complete in the follow-up, was the self-focused and other focus letters equal? Was this a good comparison between the two groups? And the answer is yes. I'm not sure quite how it happened, but there were 139 of the self-focused condition respondents and 138 of the other focused conditions. So it was actually a perfectly even split between the two, even though they had such a low rate of that 17% actually responding to that follow-up survey. So to summarize what they found in AIM-1, basically the letter worked as far as improving the scores in all three categories from baseline and those who responded to the survey. But the focus of the letter, where you're focused on yourself or focused on the other person, really didn't matter as far as improving scores, at least in a statistically significant way. AIM-2 looked at the engagement of the intervention and the reactions to getting an emotional exhaustion score. Over 75% of those who completed the follow-up survey found that they agreed slightly, strongly, or very strongly that since writing the letter, it had gotten easier for them to think of things to be grateful for which is one of the goals because gratitude in general is known to be a very strong resource and a very good way to prevent emotional exhaustion. So finding something like this actually made it easier to find gratitude later on means this can hopefully last longer than the one week period. And Duke University has done some other studies that have proven that Interventions like this combined with other things can cause long-term reductions in your emotional exhaustion and other burnout scores. One other thing I wanted to bring up from this section was after receiving their initial emotional exhaustion scores, 81% said that knowing their burnout score alone made them want to work more on it. And almost 94% of the respondents wanted to increase their resilience. They wanted to be more resilient after getting the results of the study. Not the results of this study, but their personal emotional exhaustion score. So this brings up an interesting question, whether or not the intervention itself of writing the letter or getting your scores had more of an impact on reducing emotional exhaustion. The thing is, these two are so intertwined and the interventions happened basically simultaneously. So you got your results of your emotional exhaustion score and wrote the letter that same time period. So both of them happening at once, and then you're following up and getting responses that could impact both of them. So there's no way to know if one made a bigger impact than the other, or if it was just the combination of the two that made a bigger impact. It's hard to say. It also makes you wonder how many people are experiencing burnout or emotional exhaustion, and they don't even know it. One of the questions that the authors asked were if people were surprised by their burnout score, and a lot of people said yes, that they were surprised by their score. And the people who said they were surprised most often were those with the higher scores, those that were in that moderate to severe category. If you are watching or listening to this right now and you're not sure where you stand as far as your burnout, I have a checklist of 10 common burnout signs that you can go ahead and download. It's absolutely free. It's at happyfarmlife.com slash burnout signs. 
you can go through the checklist and see how many of those things relate to you. And that's a good indicator where you're at right now. This just gives you a little bit of an idea of some of the things that can occur in your life if you are experiencing burnout or experiencing some of the signs of burnout, such as emotional exhaustion. Next, we're going to talk about AIM-3, which reviewed linguistic differences based on emotional exhaustion level at baseline and improvements in emotional exhaustion. The decision to look at this was because of past studies that were done on subjects with depression. And so in those studies, people who were depressed had different linguistic styles of writing than those who are not depressed. And you saw a difference in their word choice change as their depressive scores changed as well. So was their writing having more negative emotions versus positive emotions included as they wrote? There were also some categories that they looked at that focused more on that self versus other part of the study. However, there was no difference here, like we saw previously in the other aim that they looked at to see if there's any difference between their emotional exhaustion scores. The way the authors did this was the letter was put through a linguistic inquiry and word count software program. And it used that to see whether or not there were more negative words associated or more positive emotion words associated with emotional exhaustion scores. So negative emotion words were things like annoyed, angry, and scream, which I do find to be a little bit interesting to find them in a gratitude letter, but to each their own. And then positive emotion words were things like appreciate, funny, and thanking somebody, like thank you. So the results did show that negative emotion words were more frequently used in gratitude letters with more concerning levels of emotional exhaustion at baseline. So people with more emotional exhaustion use more negative emotion words in their gratitude letter. So with all this information, what should you do about it? First, you need to learn your emotional exhaustion score. You may be emotionally exhausted or experiencing some level of emotional exhaustion and not even realize it. Without addressing it, it will worsen over time, and the more severe it gets, the harder it will be to treat. Even if you don't think you're experiencing emotional exhaustion right now, you should figure out what your baseline is. And then do a follow-up check in six months to see where you are then and compare that to your previous scores. If you see a change, whether it's positive or negative, figure out what caused the score to change in the first place. This helps you identify things that improve your emotional exhaustion or worsen it. The next thing that you can do is simple. Find seven minutes in your week to write a letter of gratitude to somebody who's impacted your life and improved your well-being. It doesn't have to be somebody alive. Heck, it doesn't have to be a person. It could be a pet. You don't have to give them the letter. You don't have to tell them that you wrote it. It can be your own little secret. But find seven minutes, schedule it into your calendar so you make sure that that time is blocked off and write your letter of gratitude to somebody who's important to you. Gain the benefits that come from writing a letter like this, like reducing your emotional exhaustion score, improving your work-life balance, and your overall happiness. If you can't find seven minutes in your week to improve your well-being, you have a big problem. The last thing I want you to remember is don't take simple interventions that can improve your well-being for granted. Self-care and well-being does not have to be time-consuming or complicated. You don't have to spend hours getting a massage or live at the gym in order to get benefit from well-being practices. Writing a seven-minute gratitude letter can improve your emotional exhaustion. Putting on background music while you work on things to make you more productive can actually improve your productivity enough that you gain back time and can go home earlier so you're not spending as much time at work or school. Taking just a 10-minute walk outside to breathe some fresh air and get some sunshine can improve your mood. Simple measures to improve your well-being can have a big impact over time when you add them all up in your life together. With that, I have included the writing prompts from this article in the show notes on my website. So happyfarmlife.com forward slash resources forward slash HPL 108. This will let you easily find the writing prompts so you don't have to go back and look for them. And you can start writing your seven minute gratitude letter right away. The other great thing about this exercise is that you can do it more than once. You don't have to limit yourself to the one person that you think of first, but you can find other people in your life that impacted you, whether it is a parent, a best friend, a significant other, a professor or school teacher, or the person at the checkout counter at Trader Joe's. It really doesn't matter who it is. Just find somebody that you're grateful for, who's improved your well-being, who puts a smile on your face, and write a letter to thank them. 
Gratitude is a practice. Like anything else, the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it over time. Thank you all for watching or listening. And until next time, keep on living your happy farm life. Bye.